We are in a weird country. It's the weirdest setup I've ever built. It's literally a box and then there is a suitcase and then there is my camera. And behind me, of course, there is a mirror and the light is coming from the side. And my grandparents are having like someone who is fixing the sink right now. This is like the worst moment ever to shoot this video, but I have so many things to say about Lord of the Rings. So I guess we have to deal with it. <laughs> Gandalf! Welcome back to Torn Apart. As you can see, I'm still on holiday. This is literally the last week. I will go back to work. Don't worry about it. It's gonna be next week. Yes, because this video is coming out next week. So it is coming out next week. Yeah. I was actually quite glad that they released two episodes of The Rings of Power because I feel like the first episode was a bit disjointed and didn't really reflect exactly the potential of the series itself. I have so many things to say about it. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I've got the tattoo right here, of course. And as you've noticed, I, I have the tattoos of everything that I love. So I must love Lord of the Rings if I have it tattooed on my skin, right? I watched Lord of the Rings every single year. I have the extended 4K editions. I tolerate The Hobbit every single time I go back to it. I Just the CGI and the motion blur make me sick. And I feel like it's one of the most uneven adaptations I've seen in a really long time. On behalf of the people of Lake Town. On behalf of... But it's passable at the end of the day just because the soundtrack at least is good and some of the performances are good. So of course the expectations when it comes to this new series The Rings of Power were incredibly high but also incredibly low because we've been burnt quite recently with the Hobbit trilogy right? And of course we had to manage our expectations. The community has been incredibly mean and stupid about a lot of the casting choices for example the they've decided to go with when it comes to the series here. I will address it very quickly because I feel like it's something that needs to be addressed but also that is not the main point when it comes to this series here. The races within the, this fantasy world are the elves, the dwarves, the wizards, the hobbits or the harfoots when it comes to the series here and the humans. There are no differences that are based on skin tones when it comes to the series here and even within the different letters and appendices that Tolkien has written he's talked about darker skinned elves and darker skinned characters within his universe just to say that the way that our own world looks when it comes to the different culture differences and the different skin tones that we have and how how we treat each other that doesn't reflect within the Tolkien universe in the way that we see it. It is reflected through different races so all the arguments that you will see between elves and humans and dwarves those are the things that we could translate into the cultural and racial differences that we have on earth. So it has nothing to do with skin color and if you think that skin color is an important thing within this universe here you just don't know the universe really well. If you desire you can become one of I was really glad that they released two episodes. I was just baffled to be in this universe once again and it really revealed not necessarily plot holes within the Lord of the Rings franchise but things that couldn't really be adapted, that couldn't really be exploited just because we were in the third age of this universe and we basically were on the dawn of man when it comes to who were the most powerful people 
within this universe. The elves were almost non-existent and they didn't want to participate in anything. The dwarves, they literally don't exist anymore within the Lord of the Rings franchise. We only have a couple of them and it's incredibly sad because I feel like there is a real lack of dwarf representation when it comes to fantasy universes. They're always the butt of the joke and I feel like it's really sad. So this series really had the opportunity to show us what the apex of the dwarf civilization looked like. So now that we are in the second age, which takes place uh, thousands of years before, we get to see the elves being incredibly powerful, having different capitals, and we get to see elvish architecture, we get to see elvish inventions and technologies, and we get to see how the elvish race has been able to help the human race, for example, to evolve. But at the same time, just because they've played such a big part within the war against Morgoth, they have become kind of like the police of Middle Earth. So of course there are some arguments with the humans themselves because they feel looked down upon when it comes to the elves and I feel like anyone would feel like that when it comes to the elves just because they're such different creatures from us. They're so old, they're so wise and they feel like they can't really engage in the same kind of relationships that humans can. So it's always very difficult to write interesting and compelling elvish characters. So I feel like this is going to be one of the main issues of this series here making us relate to these elves especially because there are a lot of different elvish characters in this series the dwarves as well i was really happy in the second episode for example where we get to explore the city of the dwarves called doom which is a city that we've seen before but it was completely destroyed and dark there was no color there was no life within it we get to have a lot of dwarvish representation as well we get to see women we get to see men and women together building this kind of society. Dwarves of different ages as well and different traditions and of course we get to see Durin's family as well and it was a really heartwarming moment because we don't really show those kind of intimate looks at dwarvish culture within all the different other series and franchises and I really love that. And that moment when Elrond and Durin are arguing on the lift, it was a really powerful moment. It was something that elves really cannot understand. The passage of time and how important it can be when it comes to the lifespan of dwarves or the lifespan of humans and it was something that really really touched me not claim that which you discarded, discarded 20 I... years may be the blink of an eye to an elf but i've lived an entire life in that time a life you missed and they did it in such a small monologue, in such a small conversation, and you immediately understand everything when it comes to dynamics of how these different species have been inhabiting Middle Earth. There are so many things I wanna talk about. I was doing researches when it comes to the backstories of the first and the second episode and of this specific series here, and uh, I got lost because there are so many things that are not really present within the movies, and uh, even though I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, I haven't read all the appendixes, I haven't read all the short stories that Tolkien has written, meaning that my knowledge of this franchise kind of stops at the third age itself. For example, I have no idea that the Elvish language is called Quenya and it's kind of like an Elvish Latin when we look at it. A lot of different details like that that I had no idea. I didn't know the name, for example, of the elf who was responsible for the creation of the Rings of Power and now I know and now we know what he looks like as well. And of course we had no idea what happened in Galadriel's life as well and I feel like this is going to be an interesting series mainly for that. I am grateful you have not known evil as I have. But you have not seen what I have seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. Evil does not sleep, Elrond. It waits. And in the moment of our complacency, it 
blinds us. Looking at characters that we know, but also setting up so many different new characters that feel exciting. One really good example on how they do that is the Harfoots, which are some kind of legacy characters when it comes to the Hobbits. They come from the kind of heritage of small people who hide and they always exist on the edge of Middle Earth history because they don't really participate in anything. So they're really innocent, they're really fun to be with. And that mood really reminded me of Netflix The Dark Crystal series and the kind of innocence and the kind of fantasy bliss that you can kind of forget yourself within in between moments of war and battle and destruction and blood. And this is mainly why I almost instantly fell in love with this series even more than House of the Dragon just because it was managing all these different tones, all these different characters, action sequences, setting up all of these things so well. Being with Harfoots felt different than being with Elrond, it felt different than being with Galadriel and going on these different quests trying to find any proof that Sauron was still out there. It felt really different than being with the humans and in these really dirty villages that remind you of medieval stuff. And everything was just flowing effortlessly from one scene to the next, setting up things without feeling rushed. And that's what I was saying before when it comes to I'm glad that they showed two episodes instead of one because the first episode could have been a bit worrying if they left us like that for like a week because I had the impression that they had so many things to set up, especially when it comes to the backstories and the war of Ra and the death of Morgoth and the rise of Sauron and the idea that he went into hiding, the orcs and the elves fighting within each other and uh, why the elves decided to leave their paradise to actually go to Middle Earth and fight this battle. There were so many things that were set up, so many. A lot of different flashbacks, a lot of different voiceover work that really remind me of the best moments within the Lord of the Rings franchise. So the beginning, right when they're talking about the forging of the Rings of Power and the death of uh, Sauron and Isildur and all of that kind of stuff. It was really well set up, but at the same time it was one episode where they needed to get rid of so many different backstory things, setting up so much context so that we would understand the stakes of the universe and what has been going on within the past so that we can go forward. And the second episode was nothing like that, for example. It really felt like a consistently well-paced episode with our new characters and we don't dwell with the past anymore. And it doesn't really feel like we're dwelling with the future as well. Even though Elrond is there, even though Galadriel is there and other characters that we've seen in the Lord of the Rings franchise, for example, Isildur is gonna play a big part of this series here. And it's actually quite interesting because the creators of the series itself, so G.D. Payne and Patrick McKay have said that they want to build a lot of different characters that we've seen already in the Lord of the Rings franchise but they, we didn't really get to explore. And Isildur and the way that he was kind of possessed by the ring and corrupted by the ring is something that they want to address of course and the idea that this is like a tragic story that kind of reminds of the Godfather characters for example and they talked about Galadriel as well and the idea of building a past that doesn't really reflect the future as much as something new. Elrond as well, the actor who's playing Elrond is really, really good. It doesn't remind me of Hugo Weaving that much, but it's not necessarily something bad about it because of course elves get to change so much across thousands and thousands of years and Elrond will change as well a lot across the five seasons of the Rings of Power because yes, this is gonna be five seasons. And this is mainly how Amazon managed to get the right to the Lord of the Rings appendices. It's kind of confusing because they don't really have the rights to the Silmarillion, they don't really have the rights to the books of the Lord of the Rings if I'm not mistaken or even Hobbit, they only have the rights on what is being set up from the films and the appendixes and all the different letters and all the different like sub work that has been established by the Tolkien estate. So of course that's probably why people have been worrying for so long when it comes to this series here because there is no actual source material but they've been working with the people who actually made the Lord of the Rings franchise 
franchise work so well when it comes to it's the screenwriting when it comes to the dialogues as well they try to get a couple of dialogues from all the different appendixes that Tolkien has written trying to recreate that kind of poetic beautiful mannerism that we are accustomed to when it comes to the Lord of the Rings franchise of course when it comes to the budget and the cinematography this is insane this really looks like it was made to make fun of House of the Dragon because of the scope of everything. This really looks like a high fantasy series, while Out of the Dragon looks like a medieval fantasy at best. Of course, it's two completely different genres, so it makes sense that it would not look the same, but the Rings of Power series will literally break the internet because it will set up such incredibly high expectations for the future that it will be impossible to literally analyze and be critical and be objective about any kind of new series that will come out in the future because now we have this incredibly looking well-performed incredibly well scored series here and we'll just be doomed and disappointed for the rest of our lives now sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness They bought the rights for 250 million dollars to adapt this series here and in order to be able to make it they had to make like a special five season deal committing to spending one billion dollars when it comes to the production budget which is fucking insane of course at the end of the day i've read that prime still has to green light every single season of the lord of the rings so they can still like stop it at some point but it's kind of like a formality because it has been technically greenlit for five seasons because they spent quite a lot of money on it the thing that i like when it comes to these first two episodes is that it doesn't really feel like they're rushing things something that they're doing with also the dragon as well for example it really feels like they're taking their time setting up different villains and characters and different moods kind of creating a weird fellowship of the ring feeling that we had with the films themselves without actually feeling like a copy of Lord of the Rings it does feel like something fresh and being in this universe here it feels familiar but it really feels new especially when we'll be looking at all the different elvish capitals as I said before if we look at the dwarvish capital and then we'll get a look at the kingdom of Numenor as well which is some Something that we've never even glimpsed at when it comes to all the different adaptations of the Lord of the Rings. It's gonna be really exciting and I'm really looking forward to it at the end of the day. When it comes to adapting the second age of Middle-earth, one of the main differences that will appear across the Tolkien universe is that it takes a long time. Like a second age takes like thousands of years. And with this series here, they've decided to condense a lot of it so that we might be able to meet characters that we know, characters that we don't know all at the same time. And it's the best way to do it at the end of the day. And that's the thing that the Tolkien estate had to greenlit. Of course because it is a huge change when it comes to the source material they were even thinking about doing something non-linear when it comes to this narrative here but at the end of the day it didn't really feel natural and I feel like it's a good choice because it, it would have ended up being like foundation and I don't think that the fantasy community would have enjoyed it that much or maybe the fantasy community would have enjoyed it it's just that the common people would have been so incredibly detached from the adaptation itself if it was non-linear because at the end of the day good characters that's what drives the narratives and performances and all of that kind of stuff so that we can give out awards for example as well when it comes to the Emmys those are the things that are gonna attract normal people common people and, and not only fantasy fans so I do agree that it was definitely the best choice when it comes to adapting the story here what I really like about this series here as I said before it's the idea of exploring different types of elves as well so to really go into details when it comes to all these different species and races 
races. For example, one of our main characters is a Sylvan Health and his name is Arondir and uh, he creates like a relationship with a human. It is perfectly Tolkienish in the way it reminds me of those impossible love stories like Argon and Arwen and it will be interesting to look at as I feel like there always needs to be some kind of romance within the Lord of the Rings franchise or universe because this universe here is really built on hope. It's really built on the idea that you have to keep living for something at the end of the day. That you can't just fight Sauron, you can't just fight the dark side and then just stop living. You actually have to create a life for yourself while also fighting the dark side and that's something that is really inherent within the universe itself. I just hope they don't do it for all the different characters. For example in the second episode it is set up that Galadriel meets this other person while she's an RPG and there is some kind of tension in between them. I really hope that it's not like some weird sexual tension again because one impossible love story between an elf and a human is enough. I don't need to see it that much. Especially because within this series here we'll be addressing the kingdom of Numenor which is literally a kingdom of elf elves. So it makes sense to address it there. We don't have to create weird love triangles and weird relationships for every single character of our own story. For example when it comes to the Harfoots and when it comes to Eleanor I really don't see her going into some kind of weird relationship. Maybe because she has a weird almost childish personality that you can see with the hobbits as well. This is different. He could have landed anywhere and he landed here. I know it sounds strange, but somehow I just know he's important. It's like there's a reason this happened, like I was supposed to find him. Me. Hey. They don't really have a very active sexuality, you know, but that has to do with Tolkien's writing as well because he was really Christian, he was a Mormon if I'm not mistaken, so it makes sense that uh, his characters wouldn't be that horny. In contrast with House of the Dragon, of course. <laughs> One of the many mysteries that we have within these two episodes here is the man falling from the sky and even on Wikipedia and different interviews and it's not really specified who he is but for me it's pretty obvious that he is 100% a wizard and if you want to be even more specific because I went and did my researches I'm pretty sure he's gonna be one of the main two blue wizards which we didn't get to see within the Lord of the Rings movies of course because of course in the Lord of the Rings universe we had already Radagast, we had Saruman and we had Gandalf but those are not the only three wizards that have been sent to Middle Earth to fight Sauron because there has been two other wizards which are called the Blue Wizard and their names are Alatar and Palando and it is kind of conveniently perfect that if they choose to adapt those two wizards because those are the wizards that we don't really know much about when it comes to even Tolkien's writings. It is said that they went into East and maybe they created some, not some cults, but they tried to teach magic to common people so that they would be able to defend themselves but they didn't really engage that much much with the rings of power they didn't really engage that much with the war itself like all the other wizards that we know so there is a lot of untapped potential there and why am I saying that because it is specified when I was doing my researches that literally these spirits of these wizards were sent to Middle-earth by some kind of gods or immortal beings and and you can actually get a glimpse of them when it comes to all the different references and ways of sayings that the people of Middle-earth have when it comes to the powers of Valar and when it comes to Aule. There are so many things that I learned just by googling things and going on the Lord of the Rings Wikipedia and it's really funny because of all the things that I just talked about I knew nothing about and it's really interesting how this series shows that potential. The Lord of the Rings universe has so much potential and Tolkien has written so many different stories and added so many different details to this universe and it is worth exploring more. So I'm really Really happy that they created this series because we will get to explore all of those things and uh, that's why I'm so excited at the end of the day. It is even more lore and even more world building that we've seen within Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon. This is real fantasy shit and I'm really happy to be experiencing with all the different fans and I'm really looking forward to all the different episodes at the end of the day. So we're done with two episodes and we still have six to go and the series is gonna be ending mid-October 
October approximately by episode 8. I'm glad that they made episodes at the end of the day because I feel like it's the best way to tell a very coherent story. Every single time I see a series with 12 episodes it always feels like there are filler episodes and I don't even want to address series that have more than 12 episodes because it's just awful. It's just incredibly awful and predictable screenwriting that I'm not really excited about anymore. If you think about superhero shows especially like the CW stuff they tend to have like 22 episodes of like 40 minutes which is just insane when it comes to writing good compelling stories plot lines characters etc etc eight episodes is perfect we still don't know the titles of the new six episodes that are gonna be coming in the next few weeks it's gonna be directed by a lot of different people but I'm not really worried about that especially when it comes to fantasy stuff and especially because Disney Marvel is not behind this so there is no way that I can actually blame them for having different directors on these episodes here because these are literally movies this is why what I was talking about before when it comes to this series will break the internet because this is the kind of quality that we're not really used to anymore when I watched Sandman a couple of weeks ago I really had that feeling where wow every single episode of this series feels like a movie it feels very contained it still keeps going when it comes to the season storyline and it's really well handled but there are not that many series like that when you think about it and it makes me really sad House of the Dragon I hope is gonna be like that and I hope that this is gonna be the same anyways let me know what you thought of the rings of power if you're a super fan let me know down in the comments what your predictions are what you expect that will be happening in this season here and even tell me if you have an idea of how they're going to be splitting this second age in between five seasons because i have no idea i really don't know like all the different elements or even battles that are going to be happening in within the second age and as you can see i didn't even know a lot of the details of the universe itself and i've been watching lord of the rings movies and reading the books for more than 10 or even 15 years just to tell you how incredibly dense and complex this universe is and how excited I am to be in it again and uh, it just looks so beautiful every single frame of this two episodes were just beautiful paintings that I want to hang on my wall and I'm just really excited for the future don't forget to like and subscribe every single like that you drop will go to Tolkien himself and all the incredible work that he did because I feel like we're starting to appreciate his work even more more nowadays and thanks to this series here which is proving how deep the lore is and how much work he put into this universe here and people still think that it's just the movies it's just those awful hobbit movies but there is so much more and i'm really glad that we're getting to discover that thanks to amazon i'm patrick and this is torn apart Forse tolgo questo. La donna si offende. Quello è tuo. Vabbè, allora non si offenderà. Va bene, vuoi mm. salutare? Fai ciao ciao. Perfetto. Finito? Finito. 50. Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-